Well, welcome to the session on models of cognition. So uh, following Michael is always difficult, so I'll try my best. I'm Shams Iqbal, I'm a researcher here at MSR. And I am going to start off with this picture of me, Eric, and our intern, uh, Remo Vanderheiden, in Eric's Tesla. And this is a demonstration of how Eric likes to provide hands-on experiences. So we were working in the space of autonomous driving. We had just figured out how we could kind of like get our simulator to drive autonomously. And we were, scheduled, uh, we were designing an experiment around it. And Eric comes and says that, well, you should go out on my Tesla. And I have this inherent fear of being in things that I don't quite understand. And I was trying to kind of like get around it, but Eric said, well, come on, and you can be in the back seat. Remo gets to be in the, in the front seat. And we are on 520, and Eric starts talking to me, and I see that his hands are not on the steering wheel. And I cringe. The car drives itself safely to the In-N-Out Burger. We had a burger, we had shakes, I had probably the biggest burger in my life. And then Eric gets to demonstrate how the car does not work in identifying the roadside cones. And the car is slowly going towards the orange cones and I said, Eric, stop, stop. And he stops in time. And so that was kind of like a great demonstration of how Eric likes to think about a problem. He wants to demonstrate it and he's a risk taker. I would not have been in that car, especially not driving at all. But my foray into understanding Eric's research started way back 15 years ago. 15, yes. So I had just started as a grad student in HCI, a field that I had no clue about because I came for a very systems-oriented uh, undergrad department way back in Bangladesh. And my advisor said that, well, if you want to work in attention management, you need to read all these papers and you need to go and work with Eric Horvitz. And I tell myself that, yeah, right. I mean, why would Eric Horvitz want to work with this lowly grad student? So these were some of the papers that kind of like I read at the beginning trying to form my idea about attention management. And this was where I saw how AI and HCI came together. These were some formative papers in how you can build models of human attention, thinking about the cost and the benefits of interruption and attention management. I would like to point to the paper on the far right, Busybody, which is the first paper that actually showed how you can not only build models of human attention, but you can actually deploy them in practice in understanding how you can identify moments of interruption in, in the real world. This was a paper that Eric presented in CSCW 2004. I was a student volunteer, very low self-esteem. Somehow I went up to Eric and said, by the way, I'm a student in University of Illinois. I'm also working on this topic. I, I am using models of mental workload to identify moments of interruption. And then someone came and interrupted our conversation, which is normal, and then that conversation ended there. And I felt good about myself that I at least summoned some courage to go and talk to Eric. Well, it must have made some kind of impression because two years later, I did end up as Eric's intern and in the ASI group. And the project that we worked on was understanding how notifications and alerts can lead to chains of disruptions. Now, if you feel that it, it, wa it was pretty bad then, it was not as bad now because then we just used to have the notifications from the emails and IMs. Now we have notifications from our phones and social media and all of that. But even then, the problem was pretty dire then. We, we studied how a, a notification could entice people into responding to not only that notification, notification, but also drag you into email, starting from your Outlook email into your personal email, and then down a path of, of checking your uh, other, all other kinds of notifications and IM messages, and going down the path of shopping and checking news, and then finally you would be <coughs> able to come back. And then resumption of the task that was interrupted, that also is pretty difficult. So we wrote, wrote a nice paper, which turned out to be pretty influential in the field of interruption and attention management. Uh, I still, still see citations, so that's good. But it's, it's mostly about characterizing this, uh, this challenge in managing notifications. The other thing that we did have there is some design guidelines. This was back in 2007, it was published, and now we are starting to see some of these design guidelines being picked up the, the Microsoft products who are thinking about, okay, so these are maybe, and I'm, I'll co come to that a little later. This is how we can start thinking about distracting people from their distractions. So when I started in MSR in 2008, one of the projects that 
Eric, apart from the notification uh, management stuff, one of the pro projects that Eric was super excited about is something that he named the Prairie Project. And the idea was that, well, people come into meetings, they bring in their devices, and they bring in their laptops, they bring in their phones, and it often appears that people are not paying attention because they're so focused on, the, on their devices. And so what we wanted to do is that we wanted to understand what are the benefits and the costs of bringing in a device. Because I could bring in a device and I'm actually taking notes, and that's helping my uh, attendance to the presentation. But I could also be on social media. And so it's difficult to tell from just like watching people. So we were collecting videos of people and we were trying to characterize this problem. And the reason why Eric called this the Prairie Project is that when we sped up the videos, everyone looked like they were going like this and this, and it seemed like they were, their heads were nodding up and down. And it seemed like prairie dogs. So. In, in, in my folder, it is called the Prairie Project. And so we, di we, we did a paper on this in Kai, and it, it, it's, it's something that we probably will follow up, but we haven't since. The main topic that I have been working with, on, uh, with Eric on at MSR is manage, managing attention in the car. So we drive these vehicles, our attention is somewhat fragmented. We feel that we are able to drive and do other stuff. That's why we have all these different capabilities of multitasking in the car. But we want to characterize this and understand what are the challenges. And I'm going to try to see if I can play this video. OK. So this is a driving simulator. And we were looking at Hello. how we can I help. Need directions from your office to the closest mall. Oh, that's. Uh a little complicated, but not, not very hard. You basically uh, go down, go left uh, onto 148th Street, go all the way down uh, to 8th Street, um, make a right turn, go all the way down 8th, uh, keep on going until you get to Bellevue Way. Then you'll basically make a left on Bellevue Way, and you'll see Bellevue, the Bellevue uh, Mall. Thanks a lot. Bye. So, I mean, it's a probably a little step down from the Tesla, but this is a demonstration of how Eric gets involved in projects that he's excited about. I was creating all these uh, driving simulation uh, tracks, and Eric came to the driving simulator room and said that, well, I want to try it out, and I want to try out the system. And so we had uh, three or four projects in this space, and one of the things that was influential in this case is that we first observed the use of microtasks that can be easily interleaved with driving. If you notice that Eric was giving directions, but it was also broken down into smaller chunks. And then in some cases, he was pausing a little. And in a real world, you would pause, you would focus on driving, and then you would answer again. Um, what we also found is that if you have tasks that require more cognitive engagement where you're trying to recall information, those kinds of tasks are more difficult. And this is kind of like the type of guidance that we are now using in our uh, uh, foray into microtasking. We also looked at the roles of how we can have assistance in the car and help drivers not only maintain safety, but also safely multitask. And this is leading into how you can think about assistance like Cortana in the car. We're not going to help, help you get your things done, but also focus on safety and make sure that you're driving safely, and that is your foremost uh, uh, focus. And we have also looked at, a little bit into the future, the role of LRs to facilitate handover in autonomous driving. Right now, the way that the handover ro works is that tells you with a, not too much time for you to start preparing, but we looked at how we can maybe get these alerts to happen a little earlier so that it gets a, gives users an opportunity to actually disengage from what they're doing and then re-engage in, in, in driving. So in terms of influence, and I, I hinted about this at the beginning of the task, uh, beginning of the talk, is that our work about kind of using using people's tasks to remind people what they had forgotten about when they get distracted. So we, we have started looking at distracting people from distraction. So for example, you could have a micro task from one of your tasks appear in your Facebook feed. And that could remind you that, well, you were working actually on working on something else. And it's, it's a subtle reminder for you to return to work. And this is, uh, this is something that we are, we are preparing for publication. Um, we also have the notions of microproductivity, where you have these small tasks that you could interleave in different kinds of environments. And so we have looked at writing. We are looking at programming right now. And so our, all, there are all these different types of tasks that can 
that are matched well to fragmented attention scenarios. And finally, thinking about how we can manage attention across life. It's not only on the desktop, it's on your mobile device, it's at your home, it's in your car. And how can we balance attention so that you're able to do your work, but at the same time, you're also, be able to, you're also able to manage your personal life? Eric has been a great motivator, great mentor, and a great example on how to get many things done. Uh, he has been an awesome influence on the way of my thinking. I come from HCI, but I learned how to use AI in my work, and I look forward to the, the years that are coming, coming up. So thank you, Eric, and happy birthday. And I'm gonna hand off to James Fogarty, who's going to continue this conversation on models of conviction. Okay, hello. Um, so my name is James Fogarty. Uh, for those of you who uh, I haven't gotten a chance to know yet, um, I consider myself an, an interface tools researcher. So I think about the software frameworks that we use, uh, that we develop, um, that people then use to implement applications and what we can do in that. And I've, over the years, I've thought of that in terms of um, new kinds of data, new kinds of problems that are reaching into everyday applications from context awareness to machine learning, um, uh, a lot these days in personal data, uh, particularly in the context of health, uh, where, where we have all this information about ourselves and how do we use that in health decisions. Um, and a lot recently also is in uh, mobile accessibility. And so um, I was a little unsure what to do with this time. I, I could have come in and talked about interruptions, but then I saw I was on the schedule immediately after Shamsi, and, and that <laughs> seemed like a bad choice. Um, I, I could have come in and talked about health, um, but then I looked later in the schedule and saw Lauren and, and Tim and Suchi, and I was like, okay, that might be another bad choice. Um, and so what I decided to do um, was put together a talk that were about two moments that kind of stuck with me um, in my interactions with Eric over the years. Um, and so I have a setup for each moment and then the actual moment and then the, the reason I brought that up. Okay, the first one being about an idea and the, and the second being about community. Okay, so my dissertation uh, was on sensor-based models of human interruptibility. And so Eric uh, was on my committee for this work. Uh, it was a, a paper at CHI 2003 where we did a Wizard of Oz study looking at what sensors, if we took the time to build them, might be most predictive, um, doing this off of human annotation of video. Um, at CHI 2004, uh, we then deployed a bunch of sensors as a follow-on to this. Our, our Wizard of Oz results had suggested that a social engagement was a major cue for office workers, and so if we could have a microphone in this space that would just detect the presence of speech, that was a huge indication of self-reported interruptibility uh, because of social engagement. Um, at CHI 2005, uh, we did a, a, a closer look at task engagement. So we looked at um, events in, the, in a programming environment that were being generated and modeling uh, responsiveness there. Take these, put some more papers together, um, and it's a, it's a dissertation. Um, I, I will admit, when I was pulling together these images of the papers, um, I saw a paper called chi 2004pdf and I thought, Oh, that's way too old, that can't be my paper. <laughs> um, but it was. Um, and so, um, one, I wanna, to get to a moment that, that stuck, um, I'm gonna tell a story of, uh, this was the, the CHI 2004 paper. Um, and so, uh, this is where we had deployed some sensors. Uh, we, the, we submitted the paper to CHI, um, got the reviews back, got the paper accepted. I was an eager young graduate student. I had my, fine, my, my camera ready PDF. I was like, I'm gonna send it to Eric. Uh, he'll be so excited to, to see what's going on uh, and, and let him see what's going on in the work. Um, and so I get this email back from Eric um, in which he informed me that we had failed to cite his learning and reasoning about interruption <laughs> paper. Um, he was correct. <laughs> um, I won't say he was angry, but I will say I di it didn't come across as he was happy and excited to hear about the, the paper that I was sharing with him. <laughs> right? um, and it was it was uh, it was a it was a it was a classic young grad student mistake, right? Like young grad students, when the paper's done, the project's done, right? And what had happened is, is this paper of Eric's had come out in the time between when we wrote the paper and when we prepped the photo ready. Right, like it came out in that, that October, November region, if you know the CHI schedule. And so I, like, we just didn't know about it when we wrote the paper. Uh, if you look back, we do actually cite the paper. I was able to like get it in, in the photo ready version of the paper and like Eric was totally right and so on. Okay, 
But that's not actually, that's not the moment. That's not the story, okay? That <laughs> that's actually just like the setup for the story. Like grad students make mistakes, that's normal, it happens, okay? Right? Um, and the moment that, I, that I, I thought of when I was trying to think about what to, to service here actually comes five or six years later. Um, and it was in a, a program committee meeting. Um, of course, program committee meetings are confidential, right? So nobody repeat what I share with you today. Um, and so uh, the interruption literature was that much larger, right, many years later, right? So I've got more papers on the slide, but there's even more than we're here, right? Um, and we were uh, reviewing a paper that had come in and it was saying, look, there's this huge literature on interruptions, but it's all really one-sided. It's all really about the cost of an interruption, right? And we have this idea for a new perspective on thinking about interruption, which is also the value of the interruption. Oh, and it was just so sad as an AC to see this paper come through with really strong reviews and then have to say, well, yeah, it's because you're missing the whole reason we're doing this, <laughs> right? It was this, this idea that sort of set out in the very beginning, this, this idea of designing these interactions and balancing the cost and the value. Um, and then the interruption literature dove so far into half of this problem, it got to be such a big literature that if you were a new student coming to it, sometimes you couldn't actually trace it all the way back to where these ideas were coming from. Right, and, and when I was thinking about what to call it, I, I thought of that moment as just one indication of the impact of, of this idea um, and this posing of the idea that it can, it can spawn entire literatures that are so big that you can actually lose fa track of the fact that they come back to this, even though it was a super thorough review of all the interruption literature. It, it missed the one that, that actually spawned it all. Um, and so that was, that was one moment that I think kind of just speaks to some of the impact of, of this idea. Um, and then in the other moment I wanted to go more towards community. Um, and setting this one up requires talking about uh, my first two PhD students. Um, so I, I did my PhD at Carnegie Mellon. I started at the University of Washington. Uh, Salima Amershi, who's in the audience today, and, and Eric's group now, um, was technically my first PhD student. And this is based on the like hours on the email of when the grad school confirmed the dissertation was accepted, right? Um, but, but she and Kaya Patel, uh, we're really like my first pair of PhD students, uh, really intertwined in different ways, connecting on their work and feeding ideas off of each other um, and in the group. Uh, Salima's dissertation looked at end user interactive machine learning. So how can we get, how can we support everyday people, not, not experts, not people who know anything about machine learning, but everyday people in train, interactively training up classifiers in the context of other tasks that they're trying to conduct whether that's image search or um, setting up uh, sharing permissions on, on social networks, things like the, these tasks that are not really about machine learning. And um, great work, it was really really early in this space, thinking about um, everyday people using machine learning, which I think now we all see as part of the future of this space. We're gonna have this intersection, everybody's gonna encounter this. But Salima might remember, she, she presented at WIS 2010, one of these papers, and she got a question that was basically of the form like, why are you doing this? <laughs> right? She's like, couldn't you do something else with images that would be more interesting and exciting and important than this? Um, and, and that, that it, was, it, was, it was still hard in the HCI community to talk about this connection over to machine learning and what the potential of that was gonna be. Um, and then Kayer's work was more focused on software developers, uh, people who, do have expertise, they're trying to build an application that uses machine learning, but that requires new kinds of software development tools that th they didn't already have. You program with data now instead of just with algorithms, and so how do you support people in doing that? Um, and so the moment actually comes out of uh, a talk that Care had to give. Um, and so Care, uh, this was a, a, a paper in what was called the Nectar Track at, at AAAI. It, it was this track they used to have where you could come through and you had already presented your work at some other conference and you could bring it to AAAI and share that work with them. And so that way, that community could see more of the work that was going on in the world that was relevant. And, and Kayer had a paper on examining the difficulties of software developers in, in adopting machine learning. Those of you who really know Eric's CV, will also recall that this is the year that he gave his presidential address um, at AAAI. Um, and so Kayer was actually uh, in the session that was in the same, so Eric gave his address, right? I was there, I don't remember very much of it. Um, I have what's known as professor brain. Um, and so, uh, but I do remember he was really talking about the role of, of human computer interaction in this intersection um, as we've all been reminding each other of, of his points in that regard today. Um, but 
Care was speaking in the same room in the next session, right? And so Care afterwards, everybody uh, claps and people are talking to Eric and Care goes up to the front to get ready to set up to give his, his talk in the next session. And he overhears somebody come up to Eric and say, you know, Eric, you almost make this HCI area seem worthwhile. <laughs> right? And this was just like heartbreaking to care in the moment, right? He's like, oh man, now I gotta go talk in front of these people and they don't even like me, they don't think I'm worthwhile. Um, uh, but when, when I look back at it, the thing that I remember out of that, that moment is that, you know, if, if you know many HCI people, we're, we're, we're a grumpy bunch. We don't feel appreciated by the rest of computer science, right? We feel like our contributions get overlooked and ignored and other people claim our territory all the time. Michael Bernstein being a notable example, he's just always so cheerful, right? Um, but uh, even, then, even and at the time, like I said, HCI also wasn't always warm to this intersection. But 10 years ago, Eric was standing in front of AAAI championing, championing HCI as a key part of what we need in this area. He was doing that as the voice of the AAAI president at the time, right? Um, and so I just think that's, that's a really powerful thing to have been doing. Um, uh, Eric and I were together last summer. We were hosting him at, at UW. We realized that I think he is the only person who is both a AAAI, AAAI fellow and a member of the Chi Academy, right? Which is essentially the Chi Fellow appointments, right? Um, and, I, and I looked up his, his, um, his uh, blurb that they give him. It says he's recognized for his research at the intersection of HCI and, and AI. And if I could hack the internet, I think I would change this to say he's recognized for his work at the intersection. Because yes, it is his ideas, right? But it's also been that work that he's done to help promote that community that I think is part of what we're talking about here today. Okay, so thank you for that, Eric. And with that, I will turn it over to Moonwin. Hello, everyone. Can everybody hear me? Great. Wonderful. Um, so first of all, I wanted to um, th thank um, AJ and Yuri for having me here. It's a pleasure. And thank you, Eric, for choosing to celebrate this important milestone event in your life with all of us. It's wonderful. Um, so I thought, um, like uh, most of the talks that we've been hearing today, I will talk a little bit about a story. I'll tell you about the story of my interactions and collaborations with um, Eric. So uh, my first interactions with Eric date back to 2010 when I was at MSR. I came as an intern in Mary Sherwinsky's group. But my real collaborations took off when I was back in MSR, like a lot of us here in this room, in uh, between 2011 and 13 as a, as a postdoc. Um, so in uh, the winter of 2012, um, I was a relatively youngish postdoc and I had wrapped up my first project here and I was looking for um, new projects to work on. And I was getting a little bit, of little bit tired kind of looking at some of the work I've been doing throughout my PhD and in the beginning time at MSR. And I wanted to um, do something that really pushed the envelope, kind of taking some of the skills that I've developed until that point and taking them more closer to understanding and studying people. So I, I was always passionate about doing something at the intersection of computer science and social science, but it wasn't quite clear what that, those questions could be. Um, in my many meetings that happened um, during that time with Eric, um, we brainstormed lots and lots of ideas. I always left meetings with more questions um, than I had at the beginning of those meetings, and questions uh, in a positive way, questions that um, triggered even uh, promising directions to pursue um, going forward. Um, eventually, um, after a lot of conversations, uh, one direction that really resonated um, uh, with Eric and myself was the idea that how about we take these uh, volumes of data that people leave behind on um, online on these social media platforms and understand not something about big populations or aggregates of people, but rather about individuals themselves. So how do we gain insights about individuals, their underlying cognitions, their affective states, and whatnot, by looking at the longitudinal traces of data that people leave behind online? So uh, the question is, um, what are these longitudinal patterns that we could be possibly looking at? And one idea that um, evolved over these conversations with Eric was the idea that we could be looking at shifts in behavior and shifts in language that people um, share on these platforms and what those shifts could mean. So fortunately, 
at that point in time, I was also interested in the space of major life events and how people talk about those events on these social media platforms. And turns out that childbirth is a very uh, prominently discussed uh, event on social media platforms around which we can expect to see some kind of behavioral shifts. So we started to gather a bunch of data from Twitter um, uh, of new moms who had just announced that they had a child. And um, I collected a ton of data from the Twitter firehose, um, and um, those data spanned a long period of time before they announced the childbirth and a long period after that. Um, Eric, uh, Scott, and I had a bunch of different intuitions about what we might see. Um, these could be things like uh, probably new moms are talking more about uh, their experiences of the childbirth, they're probably shifting the, uh, their patterns of activity and whatnot. Um, and uh, we kind of pretty much left it at that. But what we found over the course of the analysis, over the course of time, um, were a set of analysis which, at least to me, I, I hadn't expected to see that. We found that for a subset of uh, the, the population we were looking at, we were observing patterns that I hadn't even thought of. So for a subset of the new moms, we saw some of the patterns such as decreases in their social interaction, increases in their negative affect, um, uh, increases in their self-attentional focus that could be indicated by use of first-person singular pronouns, and so on. So, so two questions arose in a lot of the meetings that Eric Scott and I had, and those were about um, two things. One was, what do these changes mean? The changes that we were not expecting to see, and um, if they mean something, how can we go about validating that? So um, going forward, we found even more revelations about these patterns that we were observing. We actually found that we can build predictive approaches to find these shifts and discover these shifts in language that, uh, that the, these set of new moms were experiencing. So Eric had a tremendous uh, uh, and clever idea at that point, which was um, to look at the mental health literature and, and find out what these shifts could mean. So at that point, you know, it was a completely wide open area for me. I was, I was naive about anything to do with health or mental health. The last class that had anything to do with people's biology was in my high school. So, um, um, so we, uh, I, I, did, I started digging into that literature and finding out what these shifts could mean. And um, I still remember there was a car ride um, when uh, we took across 520 to meet with some social workers at UW. Um, and that's when we started, it started to become clear that some of these signals could possibly mean postpartum depression, but we still wanted to be sure. So it led, it led to um, a bunch of follow-up projects, one of which was to collect, collect uh, directly ground truth information about postpartum depression in these new moms, and then building predictive models which um, could help us identify if these behavioral shifts relating to postpartum depression, or even the risk of postpartum, could be predicted by looking at people's um, social media data. And we found that that was indeed the case. In fact, by simply looking at over an year's worth of Facebook data of these new moms, we could predict uh, pretty well who is likely to be at risk of postpartum in the future. Going forward, this opened up a tremendous set of opportunities for us to look at other mental illnesses, other kinds of shifts relating to people's cognitions and, and people's um, affect, um, looking at different platforms and populations and so forth. Um, and even different questions. So I've, I'm just gonna quickly highlight this project that we did, which was another set of validation to our approaches by comparing um, uh, the outcomes of the models that we had about depression using social media data with uh, ground truth information from uh, the Centers for Disease Control and Prevention. And what we found was that actually the rates of depression that, that we could have from social media actually mimic pretty well the rates that are reported um, by the government. And in fact, we um, were able to get a lot of new insights about the behaviors and experiences of specific subpopulations, including gender groups, um, how depression manifested over the course of a day, over months, over years, and so forth. My interactions with Eric were not just limited to these technical ones. In fact, one of the things, one of the biggest things I have learned by interacting with Eric was to think beyond the technicalities and think, be, think critically about what those technical contributions might mean for the broader society and also for uh, other fields. 
So in many of the follow-up conversations that I have had with Eric over the years, we have taught a number of things about what would be the implications of these approaches uh, for things such as building uh, new kinds of interventions, about uh, being able to diagnose mental illnesses better, about fighting the stigma that exists for these conditions um, and whatnot. And importantly, how do we go about collaborating uh, with people across disciplinary lines? So by the time I left MSR and um, I started at Georgia Tech, um, there was no doubt of questions for me to examine. I um, started the Social Dynamics and Wellbeing Lab and um, we started to expand from what was a nascent exploration at MSR. And um, we, kind of we have been pursuing two directions. One is kind of looking at how we can improve diagnosis by better modeling uh, people's digital traces and using those traces as a form of data, as a, as a sensor of people's cognitions and behaviors. And also how those things can be um, used to intervene and bring support and help to individuals in a timely fashion. So um, I wanted to highlight three lessons um, that I have taken forward uh, from my collaboration with Eric. And um, they actually uh, summarize pretty well three projects that I'm currently doing. One of the lessons was how to give back to the community and engage with the community directly. So in one of my current directions, we are, we are working um, with stakeholders on the Georgia Tech campus uh, to address the challenges of college student mental health uh, by looking at the digital traces um, of voluntarily shared information of um, students. The second lesson I had was to work across disciplinary lines and actually work with clinicians. I mean, um, Eric having being the other kind of more useful doctor as well. Uh, <laughs> um, uh, one of the new collaborations that I'm really excited about is with a set of the doctors who actually help people. So clinicians and psychiatrists. And uh, we are looking at two outstanding questions in the mental health field uh, related uh, to schizophrenia, which is reducing the duration of the illness and how to predict relapse, which happens to be um, really high in this population. And the third lesson was to really be bold. And um, this is something that a lot of us have mentioned this morning and really uh, think out of the box and push the envelope. So the third project that we have, been, uh, we have just started is a very big collaboration across multiple partners. And here we are taking a multimodal approach to um, look at the kinds of data that can be modeled in order to better understand people's workplace experiences, what makes them productive, what increases their stress, and um, how can we design tools to improve those workplace experiences of people. Um, on that note, I'm going to end. Uh, thank you very much, Eric, and happy birthday. And we have one more James. I'm kind of between two James, and um, James Pennybaker from uh, University of Texas is next. Uh, okay, uh, I'm Jamie Pennebaker. Um, the reason this, the slides thing aren't used going forward is because I didn't actually bring any slides. Uh, today, what I'd like to do is to say a little bit about my role here. Turns out I was not an intern. Uh, <laughs> I am not currently an intern. Uh, I. It's even odd how I got here. I'm a social psychologist. I don't even know the difference between HCI and HAI. To me, they're all the same. As a social psychologist, I stumbled into the world of HCI and AI through a number of odd uh, paths. And in fact, it was probably 14 years ago, before I met Eric, uh, I had been doing a lot of work on a computer program that I had uh, worked on. It's called Linguistic Inquiry and Word Count, LIWC or LUC. And I was starting to discover how language was related to people's psychological states. A friend of mine, Ray Mooney, in our computer science department invited me to a talk that, that someone was giving in their department, someone from Yahoo, who was doing research at Yahoo. and this person showed a, a whole series of slides and studies that they had done looking at 
attitude change, its relationship to behavior, the size of groups, uh, all of these things that are traditional topics in social psychology, and in social psychology we had done all these studies in, in laboratories, and this person was putting up on slide after slide after slide some of the basic theories and findings of social psychology, except that he was basing his data on millions of people as opposed to ours, which had been little studies of 20, 30, 40 people each. And I was seeing that he, he had rediscovered social psychology, looking at it from a much, much broader perspective. And afterwards, I said, we need to talk. And so I said, have you read anything about social psychology? And he said, what is social psychology? And it's, I started to realize that the worlds that I had lived in and the worlds that were evolving in the social media world and in computer science were st starting to look at very similar problems from very different perspectives. And in many ways, this was the, the kind of the, what the, the experience that changed my worldview to make me appreciate the importance of of interdisciplinary work. Now, here it's sounding like HCI and AI, if you do those two things, that's, that's uh, multidisciplinary. To me, multi, multi, multidisciplinary work goes way, way beyond the, the doors of our respective colleges or respective areas. And that the greatest science, if you look at the Nobel winners, almost all of them have gotten there because they have crossed their area with very different areas. Eric and I met at a, this bizarre small conference many years ago, it was almost 10 years ago, uh, that was interdisciplinary. And the two of us started talking and I was so impressed with the work that he was doing, the way that he was thinking, we became kind of natural allies. So he has invited me to come to MSR and, and in the summers I come here uh, this is, I'm on my third, third visit here, and to me, coming to MSR is like coming into a candy shop. And basically, unlike a, an intern that's really working on a particular project, I just kind of walk around and talk with people. And to me, this is the most exciting way to start to come up with new ideas and to help to build this cross-fertilization. One thing that I hope that, that my talk today and in talking with you all later today is for you to, to encourage you to go at your, wherever you are, if you're at a university or even if you're at, at another company, go talk to people in psychology. Social psychology is one area that's particularly relevant to many of the topics that we've been hearing. Uh, also business schools and, and other areas. Now this session that, that, uh, that I'm part of is called Cognition. One of the things that I've been interested in for the beginning of my career has been the nature of attention. How do we pay attention th to things in our world? Early on, I was interested in the distinction between paying attention to things in the outside world versus paying attention to ourselves. This idea was something that I referred to as competition of cues, that uh, when the external environment is threatening, or if it's completely boring, what we do is we naturally look inward. And in fact, I started my early work dealt with physical symptoms. When do people report and when are they aware of physical symptoms and sensations? And they're most aware when they're alone, when there's, there's no stimulation from the outside world. And if there's one or two people around, then the individual is the least likely to report physical symptoms. This early work on symptoms led, led me down a long, a long trail of uh, interesting r work that went in various ways, but the, one of the things that I became interested in eventually was the nature of language. And there had been some early work on, on focus of attention where people were brought into laboratories and they were asked to fill out a questionnaire or to write something, and half the time they'd go into this laboratory and there would be a just a uh, uh, a mirror that had been turned around so it wasn't facing them, and they would uh, do the task, or the mirror would be turned around facing them, and there'd be a note saying, please don't remove this, there's gonna be an experiment later with this. It turns out if people are, are writing and there's a mirror in front of them, they start using the word I at much higher rates. In other words, when people are made to be self-focused, they use I more, and in fact, it turns out people who are depressed uh, use I at much higher rates, and in fact, depression has often been viewed as a, as a disease of self-focus. 
In any case, I started to become interested in the nature of language and its relationship to psychological state. And it was also, as I got into this in much more detail, I started to become interested in uh, a certain class of words that are called function words. And function words are kind of the junk words. M many of you think of them as stop words. These are words like pronouns, I, me, you, he, she, uh, prepositions, to, of, for, articles, conjunctions, auxiliary verbs, etc. They're the shortest, the shortest words in most languages. They are used at very high rates, uh, and even though there's very few of them. So in English, there's really only about 180 common uh, func function words, and they account for about 60 to 65 percent of all the words that we say, we hear, we use, we read, etc. As I got into this, I started to realize that function words also give us a sense of where people are paying attention. So, for example, an individual, uh, a person who is paying attention to other people, they will use words like, uh, uh, if they're paying attention to a person they're, they're talking to, they use the word you. If they're paying attention, if they're thinking about other people, they'll use he, she, or they. If they are thinking about their group and, that, and the people that they're working with, they tend to use we. And if they're self-focused, they use the word I. I, for example, does not mean that a person who's arrogant, arrogant confident, et cetera, they actually use the word I less than people who are not confident. In any case, getting into this, I started to become interested in it. what can these words tell us, tell us about people. So for example, we did a number of studies looking at, at pronouns and finding out that people who are, have, uh, uh, who are leaders, for example, use a certain kind of language, that a lot of use of words like you or we, and individuals who it, in a group are more insecure and self-focused, they use words like I quite a bit. I also became interested in how we can start looking at language and how, by looking at how two people connect with one another. We came up with an, a metric that we call language style matching. Looking at the degree to which two people or more people are connecting with one another. So for example, if two people use articles at the same rate and prepositions at the same rate and pronouns at the same rate, they're more likely on the same page. And in fact, in uh, speed dating, individuals who are using these words, who are matching linguistically, are more likely to go out on a subsequent date than people who don't. People who are in an early relationship, in, if, in our analysis of uh, uh, their instant messages back and forth, uh, we found that the more they're matching, the more likely that couple is still gonna be together several months later. In my visits here, one of the things I've become fascinated with is uh, how individuals, how people are, start to interact with uh, things like robots with, or uh, other kinds of virtual agents. Can we start to use these things like language style matching to get a sense of the degree to which the two, the, an individual and a robot are connecting? Now, there's a really interesting model that we have to think about. First of all, how do you get along with your car? In other words, here is a machine. You have a personal relationship with your car. And my guess is some of you, I know Eric and his Tesla, that, that's a love relationship, but I'm not sure it is reciprocal. But, <laughs> but, but the fact is, you know, all of us, sometimes it'll be a car, it might be a, uh, a plant or whatever, but there's a relationship, at least you perceive a relationship. That, and what does that mean if you have the relationship? It means you're paying attention to it. You're learning about it. Now, in most systems, this is reciprocal. So does the car learn about me? Well, that's kind of an interesting question. Does, and, and if we get into the robotics world, is that robot learning from me? And this gets into the whole reinforcement learning model, but it's essentially with two humans, if I am dealing with you, you are also dealing with me. And one thing that we find in terms of style matching, if two people are connecting, this language style matching is a marker of the two people paying attention to one another. If I'm paying attention to you at a high rate, ideally you're paying attention to me at a high rate. What this means in terms of training a robot, not only does it, do we want this robot to start speaking like me, but, I, the, but 
we also need to ask the question. So here, right now, the way th that we do this evaluation is we have a human come in, deal with a robot, and then we ask the person, so how, does the ro how do you like the robot? Is the robot doing this and so forth? But what we should also be asking the robot is, how much did you like old Jamie? Did you, you, you feel as though he really cared about me and so forth? And we need to have the robot connect with me the same way that I connect with the robot. Now, what this, this has some interesting implications, I think, in terms of, of kind of the future of robotics and, and uh, uh, kind of machine-human interaction, that, that this has to be a kind of a, a, a dual pathway. Now, all of this also now ties into the nature of mentorship. Now, I'm not implying that a graduate student or an intern's a robot. Rather, we need to start thinking about this in terms of what makes for a really good mentor. I should say that one of the thrilling things for me in coming to MSR has been seeing the, the culture here. This culture is f phenomenal. And I think a large, large part of any given culture is set up by the leader. And Eric is a good example of this, of somebody who is almost a Pied Piper. And by analyzing Eric, you get a, a sense of, under, of understanding what, a good, what good mentorship is. And m many of you are faculty members and you have graduate students now, and there are many rules that we know. One, one of these is, here's a, a, kind of an obvious one, a good mentor pays attention to his or her students, connects with those students, pays attention to them, and is constantly learning more and trying to, to learn and to collaborate with them. And at the same time, a good mentor is wildly enthusiastic about what you, what you were doing. If you were the mentor, your excitement is contagious. And, and also is supportive and is all accepting. So if the student says, you know, this project doesn't interest me, I'm really interested in poetry, a good mentor is gonna say, that's great. It, it, it's like the talk earlier today. Yes, and go ahead and, and do it, and I'll go with you down that path. But the fact is, to be a mentor requires this ability to, to uh, bring people into your exciting world. I know I look at Eric, he certainly has all these qualities. He has this energy, the enthusiasm, this sense of support, this really exciting uh, uh, focus on things. I've never been in a conversation that afterwards I didn't come away thinking, wow, that's, that was a great, my idea was great, because he, he makes it sound great. And in fact, in preparing for this talk, I went back and analyzed all the email that uh, Eric has, has sent to me, I know this is, uh, I did get, go through, I was meaning to go through the IRB, but I didn't get around to it. And, and looking at how he used uh, pronouns, his, his use of I words. The, so the, in emails, the average level of I words is usually about 4%. His was about 1.2%, really, really low. He doesn't use I much. Um, you. The average person uses you at about less than 1%. His was almost 3%. And in terms of we, the average person is probably 0.8%. He was 4%. This is a sign of somebody who really is excited about others, excited about the groups that he's in. And this is what I think not only uh, is Eric great at it, but it's also a model that I think all of us can benefit in terms of being mentors ourselves. Eric, it's an honor to spend my time with you and to be here, and thank you all very much.